In part four of lecture one, we will discuss memory. The design constraints on a computer's memory can be summed up by three questions. How much? How fast? How expensive? The question of how much is somewhat open-ended. If the capacity is there, applications will likely be developed to use it. The question of how fast is, in a sense, easier to answer. To achieve greatest performance, the memory must be able to keep up with the processor. That is, as the processor is executing instructions, we would not want it to have to pause waiting for instructions or operands. The final question must also be considered. For a practical system, the cost of memory must be reasonable in relationship to other components. As might be expected, there is a trade-off among the three key characteristics of memory, namely capacity, access time, and cost. A variety of technologies are used to implement memory systems, and across this spectrum of technologies, the following relationships hold. Faster access time, greater cost per bit. Greater capacity, smaller cost per bit. Greater capacity, slower access speed. The dilemma facing the designer is clear. The designer would like to use memory technologies that provide for high capacity memory, both because the capacity is needed and because the cost per bit is low. However, to meet performance requirements, the designer needs to use expensive, relatively lower capacity memory with fast access times. The way out of this dilemma is not to rely on a single memory component or technology, but to employ a memory hierarchy. A typical hierarchy is illustrated on the slide. As one goes down the hierarchy, the following occur. Decreasing cost per bit. Increasing capacity. Increasing access time. Decreasing frequency of access to the memory by the processor. Thus, smaller, more expensive, faster memories are supplemented by larger, cheaper, slower memories. The key to the success of this organization is the decreasing frequency of access at lower levels. We will examine this concept in greater detail later in this lecture, when we discuss the cache, and when we discuss virtual memory later in the course. A brief explanation is provided at this point. Suppose that the processor has access to two levels of memory. Level 1 contains 1,000 bytes and has an access time of 0.1 microseconds. Level 2 contains 100,000 bytes and has an access time of 1 microsecond. Assume that if a byte to be accessed is in level 1, then the processor accesses it directly. If it is in level 2, then the byte is first transferred to level 1 and then accessed by the processor. For simplicity, we ignore the time required for the processor to determine whether the byte is in level 1 or level 2. The figure shown here shows the general shape of the curve that models this situation. The figure shows the average access time to a two-level memory as a function of the hit ratio H, where H is defined as the fraction of all memory accesses that are found in the faster memory, for example, the cache. T1 is the access time to level 1, and T2 is the access time to level 2. As can be seen, for higher percentages of level 1 access, the average total access time is much closer to that of level 1 than that of level 2. In our example, suppose 95% of the memory accesses are found in the cache, h equals 0 0.95. Then the average time to access a byte can be expressed as 
0 0.95 times 0 0.1 seconds plus 0 0.05 times the sum of 0 0.1 second plus 1 second equals 0 0.095 plus 0 0.055 which equals 0 0.15 microseconds. The result is close to the access time of the faster memory. So the strategy of using two memory levels works in principle, but only if the four conditions we discussed before apply. By employing a variety of technologies, a spectrum of memory systems exist that satisfy the first three conditions. Fortunately, the fourth condition, that decreasing frequency of access to the memory by the processor will be, is also generally valid. The basis for the validity of the fourth condition is a principle known as a locality of reference. During the course of execution of a program, memory references by the processor for both instructions and data tend to cluster. Programs typically contain a number of iterative loops and subroutines. Once a loop or subroutine is entered, there are repeated references to a small set of instructions. Similarly, operations on tables and arrays involve access to a clustered set of data bytes. Over a long period of time, the clusters in use change, but over a short period of time, the processor is primarily working with fixed clusters of memory references. Accordingly, it is possible to organize data across the hierarchy such that the percentage of accesses to each successive lower level is substantially less than that of the level above. Consider the two-level example already presented. Let level two memory contain all program instructions and data. The current clusters can be temporarily placed in level one. From time to time, one of the clusters in level one will have to be swapped back to level two to make room for a new cluster coming in to level one. On average, however, most references will be to instructions and data contained in level one. This principle can be applied across more than two levels of memory. The fastest, smallest, and most expensive type of memory consists of the registers internal to the processor. Typically, a processor will contain a few dozen such registers, although some processors contain hundreds of registers. Skipping down two levels, main memory is the principal internal memory system of the computer. Each location in main memory has a unique address, and most machine instructions refer to one or more main memory addresses. Main memory is usually extended with a higher speed, smaller cache. The cache is not usually visible to the programmer or indeed to the processor. It is a device for staging the movement of data between main memory and processor registers to improve performance. The three forms of memory just described are typically volatile and employ semiconductor technology. The use of three levels exploits the fact that semiconductor memory comes in a variety of types, which differ in speed and cost. Data are stored more permanently on external mass storage devices, of which the most common are hard disk and removable media, such as removable disk, tape, and optical storage. External non-volatile memory is also referred to as secondary memory or auxiliary memory. These are used to store program and data files, and are usually visible to the programmer only in terms of files and records, as opposed to individual bytes or words. A hard disk is also used to provide an extension to main memory known as virtual memory, which will be discussed later in the course.